Okay, yeah. so my name is Fiona Patton. I'm a Member of Parliament in Victoria in the Upper House. And I'm from a party called the Reason Party, which used to be sex, the sex party, but we kind of went from being a petulant toddler, um, <laughs> hopefully into a, an awkward teenager, um, which is why we're now the voice of reason, because teenagers know everything. Uh, now, where, why I'm here is because I have been pushing drug law reform in the last term of government, and we established, I think, a, a very um, good drug law reform inquiry that brought out a 600-page report with 49 recommendations, most of which require no legislation to, to, to effect and would improve, um, would improve drug policy in Victoria no end and would move it out of the criminal justice system and moving it more into a health and so as a health and social issue. So I'm here to try and get those 49 recommendations up. I'm also going to debate in May a, a motion to establish a select committee to look at cannabis regulation, and that's the adult use of cannabis, legalising, licensing and regulating that. And I am hoping to be successful in getting that committee up. And also, finally, the supervised injecting centre, which I was fortunate enough to be the person to bring the, the legislation through the House and finally convince Wayne Gatt the um, Secretary of the Police Association, that it was a good idea. But Demos, Judy Ryan in the House, and millions of others were also part of that. Hi everyone, my name is Nick Kent. Um, so I'm the National Director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy Australia. Um, so we're the youth kind of movement um, in, uh, in Australia around drug policy reform. Um, so we're building university chapters and local groups all around the country um, and kind of connecting young people to the evidence base and to the politicians in the space and the experts and kind of, yeah, kind of collectively overcoming the internalised stigma um, that is a part of being an outspoken young person in this space um, and really trying to um, yeah, become a powerful voice for advocacy um, and hopefully kind of um, what I believe is potentially a missing piece in the puzzle of drug law reform, which is a vocal and active youth movement. Um, so my background is actually as a, as a teacher. Um, so I am a history and a language teacher originally, and part of what I might try and communicate today is, is embedded in a bit of that historical stuff. Um, but I guess what put me on this path was writing my thesis on the drug education curriculum in high schools, um, and then getting involved in... <laughs> you have such a thing. Yeah, no, um, so my thesis essentially found that we don't. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, giraffes. Yeah, giraffes, that's right. Yeah, well, they are the experts, obviously. <laughs> I don't know how much time we have, so I'm not going to start. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, that's a whole other kettle of fish uh, in terms of how we speak to young people about drugs in schools, or more importantly, how we don't. Um, and yeah, that's some, some work that SSDP Australia is increasingly doing. There's some school-based drug education work as well. Um, we're running right now a, a growing uh, national campaign for pill testing. And um, we have a bunch of other stuff um, underway. So in terms of what that might mean, <laughs> where to start, uh, SSDP is part of an international network of um, young people and student organizations. Um, I actually just got back yesterday from Europe. Um, so I was attending the 62nd United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs, um, which is basically the international mechanism of the international drug control system. Uh, so I learned a lot, and I, uh, long story short, I might like to review some of what I say with some of the stuff happening inter internationally, because this policy area particularly is, you know, it's an international drug war. Um, we don't. We often don't frame it like that in Australia, but it is, and that's um, it. Does have impacts on our policy discussions, and I think there's a lot that we can learn internationally as well. Um, so I might try and touch a bit on that, um, and also essentially just bring forth the idea that well, you know, I might have been at the UN and everything, um, but long story short, if I learn anything in those ten days, it's that the utter importance of grassroots organising at the local level is the only thing that's actually going to achieve change. I probably, oh, there I am. Um, I'm David, just David. Uh, and by day, I am an emer 
emergency consultant and a father of five very naughty children. And um, by night, I suppose I'm accused of being an activist, at best an advocate. Largely, I'm just a fatter, more Irish version of yourselves. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm coming from where you are now. Particularly Gulliver. I used to be Gulliver's size. This is what happens. <laughs> so, um, we don't talk about pill testing in Canberra. We, we do pill testing. Um, so, maybe I can share with you some bits and pieces about how that happened. Um, and about um, our plans to bring um, our plague of insurrection further afield. <laughs> I'm Demos Christos, I'm the CEO of North Richmond Community Health, which is the organisation which operates Victoria's first, Australia's second, Southern Hemisphere's second medically supervised injecting group. First I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet the Wurundjeri people, uh, and just pay my respects to any Aboriginal people that might be here, and to their elders others past the present. Um, I really want to thank uh, Progressive Action too. Uh, I looked at the program, it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, it's so important for community, for not just activists, but community to be in fact discussing more of the topic uh, of, of today's uh, conference. Um, and it's fantastic to see uh, the energy and commitment of young people um, to these very important uh, social issues. The other thing I want to acknowledge is um, Gunna Patton. I, Gunna Patton is the greatest social reformer for the last, for the last 20 years. Because. Now, now. Now, now. <laughs> I, I just, I know, I just evidence based, just as Shana said, we're moving for evidence based here. The reason is, in one term of government, in one parliament, sorry, uh, a single parliamentary representative of the one that we named Sex Party, I, I'm old fashioned, I could. I can't, I can't get, anyway. Uh, it was the sex party then. Put up four incredibly significant bits of legislation and found a help because people are forgetting. Medically supervised injection group established. Yep. Dying with dignity legislation passed. Exclusion zones around abortion claims. So important. And the fourth was reminded Well, the fourth was either the drug law reform report or e petitions, which I'm particularly right. proud of, yeah. that you can now petition the government online, which up until two years ago you couldn't. So that's my evidence uh, about my comment. So not a not, not a comment about it. And, and it's so important uh, to uh, have those voices in the parliament and to then work with the party of government to actually implement them. That was quite extraordinary uh, that that actually happened. On election eve, uh, the premier said that this is the most progressive government in the most progressive state uh, in Australia, and there's the evidence for it. That's party of government pass that extraordinary legislation. If you think about where we were four years before to where we are now, it is absolutely extraordinary. So, uh, I just want to make sure the wonderful Judy Ryan, also in the audience. Uh, Woohoo! Judy. None of that. You can't hide those lips, Judy. No, medical <laughs> supervisor injecting them will not happen uh, without Judy's uh, group. Uh, residents of Victoria Street Drug Solutions, the most extraordinary bit of community advocacy I've seen in such a long while. So smart uh, and so successful. So well done to that group. Uh, your 200 members really are just quite extraordinary. Okay, enough of the, uh, uh, enough of the thanks. Uh, my, uh, I just want to briefly say that uh, the medical supervisor in Jumping Room was, uh, became, uh, started operations on the 30th of June 2018. So we're months into, to about that, uh, in, in, into, a, into the trial, the two-year trial. The legislation allows for a two-year trial period uh, and, and, that, the, and then the room to be uh, uh, evaluated by an independent uh, review panel chaired by Professor Margaret Hamilton and that will report to the government and should that trial prove to be successful under the legislation it can be re-licensed for a period of another three years and then the legislation ceases and the government has to decide what it will do then. So, uh, it's an extraordinary event, I think, uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, thing to happen in our community, in the Richmond community. Those of you who might have been, who either know Richmond or have visited Richmond, uh, we will be able to observe what an extraordinary impact this facility has had on the local community. Uh, We've got currently a
a, a campaign going on around pill testing here in Victoria, and the, the people who are best placed to talk about that. And really, the, the, the work that's going on both within the parliament and outside to get a whole range of support for that, uh, Fiona's best place to speak about that. So I'll hand over to you, Fiona, to thanks. talk about the current pill testing thanks. work in Victoria. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks, Gavin. Um, look, we, it, it, is, it has been difficult, and government, the, I, I raised this when, when, when we're the crossbenchers like myself, you know, when we first come into Parliament, um, we, we granted the, our, our meeting with the Premier where we say, we ask him what we want. We, we give him our wish list. Uh, mine's pretty long, but, um, <laughs> but anyway, so pill testing was obviously on it. And there was a, a, a pretty definitive, well, you're not going to get that. Um, but he said that about the Supervised Injecting Centre, and he said that about um, assisted dying as well. So, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know no means no, but sometimes, you know, you can turn a no into a yes. Uh, but when we had the drug law reform inquiry, uh, and I took some members of parliament to the secret garden, we took them to a secret garden festival, which was a music festival um, in Cambridgeshire in, in England. And it was awkward. I mean, chinos, <laughs> chinos don't really go at the festival. Um, and we took an assistant commissioner of police. Uh, again, awkward. But, um, but we, they saw firsthand what pill testing looked like and how effective it was. And, and in my mind, and I know David's going to speak more about this, in my mind, my argument is that pill testing is a loss leader. Like, that brings us in to provide some of the most crucial education and information to young people who are about to take a substance. And that is what was so remarkable about it. And that's what we saw. But when it came to writing the report, you know, I thought, well, pill testing, obviously. I mean, we all saw it. We saw it was brilliant. We saw that the police liked it, the local government liked it, and it was, you know, done and dusted. Oh, no. Oh, no. So what we got was a recommendation in the Drug Law Reform Report that said, look, you know, we think pill testing is quite good, however, we wouldn't recommend it. Um, we think it's very effective, and the research shows us that it works, but we wouldn't recommend it. Uh, what we did recommend, that there would be pill testing at the back of house. So when there was an incident, that, that, that you would have early warning systems, and even that, even an early warning system that announces when a... When a a substance, a bad substance has harmed someone, to get that information out as quickly as possible to the, to the community was still seen as a bit radical. Um, so that, that is where we got to. Um, I, I, I hope and I hope that I'm, you know, the messages I'm getting is, Fiona, leave it till after the election. Don't let, you know, pill testing bring Bill Shorten down. Um, I would have thought it would have brought him up, actually. Um, because the majority of the community supports pill testing. Um, so I think it's a vote winner. But we've been told to, to wait till after the election and also, again, convince the very charming Wayne Gatt from the Police Association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, if you want to talk, <laughs> yeah, we, could, we could talk. In these areas of policy, all of us could talk for a very long time. But I wanted to talk a little bit about Nick where you're, because you're really mobilising what Fiona's from, the, the parliamentary side, so she's dealing with the key stakeholders of that sense, but you know, this stuff doesn't happen just without community support. So I think you're key in building some of that community support. Now, you just lead us through the kind of campaign you're running. Cool. Um, so myself and, and our whole team are here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, and like, yeah, the whole movement we're building, I, I completely agree with you. Um, so um, basically my um, kind of beliefs around that really took off um, in the aftermath of the first death after last season at Def Congo Music Festival. Um, and I was up, long story short, I'm not going to go into the detail, but I was at a parliamentary session in Sydney um, called by the members of the Progressive Crossbench. And we sat around for hours listening to all the academics and people from the music festival industry and everything talk about the issue. And it was really an interesting microcosm of the conversation within Australia because you just hear this expert opinion after expert opinion and government response and no and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, yeah, we go around and around and around in circles and we've been doing that for years. And, um, and meanwhile, young people die every single festival season, yes. basically. 
Um, and I would, it's a crisis. It is a public health crisis. Um, and next summer, it's inevitably going to occur again. And that's ridiculous. Um, and um, yeah, so what's the missing piece in that equation, if you ask me? And this, I sort of said this at the session. And the session essentially ended on this note with a round of applause um, that we need a youth movement. And the, it's great to hear all you expert people, but until the affected community, which in Australia around the issue of what is internationally known as drug checking, which isn't almost, which isn't always necessarily about people at music festivals, um, but how the issue is conceived and how the um, how the harm is generally occurring in Australia at the moment is with young people at music festivals taking adulterated or essentially too strong substances because there's no regulation in what they're taking, um, and. Yeah, so, so we got to work. We got really good mentorship from an organization called the Center for Australian Progress on how to do grassroots organizing, um, which had never, I mean, with the exception of perhaps the movements in the 80s around harm reduction and stuff like that, generally hasn't really occurred in drug law reform, like since the counterculture, okay? Mm -hmm. We're like the, it's, it's building on what Demos said, you know, we're kind of, it's really cool to be in these kind of spaces now, and drug law reform, I think, is increasingly involved in that broader social change conversation. Um, which we do consider ourselves a huge part of, um, much beyond the issue of pill testing um, in terms of all kinds of things, which I hope to be able to touch on today in terms of decriminalization, in terms of what psychedelic psychotherapy might mean for the world in the future, all kinds of broader, much more systemic conversations. Um, but what we're choosing to start around is this inevitable reform of pill testing, which is an immediate public health necessity um, and that we think that um, what we want to do and what we've been doing all summer basically is using our, ch uh, our university chapters and our, our growing movement of young people to get out there to parties basically and essentially for the last three, four months we've been attending music festivals with the help of Dancewise, um, the harm reduction service in Victoria and New South Wales um, and gathering thousands and thousands of petition signatures um, and um, building a, a movement of people, um, you know, doing all this kind of um, uh, kind of grassroots campaign -y stuff that happens in the climate movement or that happens around refugee advocacy that doesn't generally happen in drug policy reform. Um, and um, I'm really excited to see where that can go. And we're really now at the phase where we're starting to kind of educate and mobilize these people um, in terms of what it means to speak openly, publicly about this. Because, um, you know, we know that well over four in five young people support field testing, but they're not activated to, as a, as a, political unit to, to communicate that. Um, and they're essentially, especially not communicating that with their elected representatives, which we think is the missing piece in, in a, a puzzle. Um, so yeah, we're, we're really excited to continue building this campaign. And um, hopefully it is, well definitely not hopefully, it is definitely just the first of one of many youth-led campaigns around drug policy reform. And yeah, we're just starting with pill testing. Excellent, well that's, uh, and, and you, you handed David, because David, uh, there is pill testing already. So we should say that this isn't an area of policy where it just, you know, we're, we're trying for the very first time. There is actually a uh, group in the mood coming up, which is, a, you know, a, uh, a festival in Canberra. But so, Dave, I'll, uh, you can talk a little bit more about uh, the success that we've actually had some success in this area, but. Yeah. yeah. So um, this represents, um, I think, you know, the, the would-be people in the room <laughs> who maybe don't understand that this has actually been going on for a while. Um, the campaign to get field testing up and running. Uh, we're now entering into our 19th year in Australia um, since we started campaigning in South Australia. Um, so it's very interesting to chat to Mr. Weatherall about um, what his opinions were regarding it. Um, we've been very lucky. We are a small jurisdiction. Um, there's only about three or 400,000 of us in the ACT. And it's a quite progressive government. It's a young government. Uh, our kids go to school with the kids of the police force and the politicians, and you can yell at them at the PTNC if they're <laughs> not introducing good policy. Um, so we were able, uh, albeit with a bit of argy-bargy, uh, to implement um, our idea about how to do pill testing. I would, I would argue that there is only uh, one sort of gold standard of pill testing, um, which is where you get to sit down with somebody yeah. and chat yeah. to them. And this back of house, term that I hear, um, I, I largely regard it as police testing. I think, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't suit the consumer at all. I only found out this week, by the way, and you excuse me just for revealing this, but uh, you know, I, I'm not sure I share your enthusiastic or optimistic 
um, opinion about Victoria at the moment. I, I do think that the federal election is important for the local politics. I think that's real. We were all rather surprised with the adamant nature of rejecting pill testing again on such a, a large majority as an Irishman. I love the politics of some, I just do. I think it's amazing. And if you're going to do something risky, the time to do it is when you return to power with more people on your side. Um, yeah. So we were kind of surprised about that attitude. We're this week equally surprised at the news that we found out, you know, covertly, because that's what we do, um, that the Victorian police and academics in Victoria are, were attempting to launch uh, covert urine drug testing um, at, um, at the Meredith Music, Music Festival without informing patrons. That doesn't to me speak of any sort of embracing of pill testing proper. That is, you know, that's where we're going to go, that's where police wants to go, that's where the politics is going to take you. So with the greatest respect, I don't yeah. think you're done yet. I think no. you've got a little bit of work to do in changing attitudes. Fortunately, the festival said, that's bollocks, we're not going to do that. And I love music festivals, there are sort of people. Um, but there will be more attempts to do that, perhaps not covertly. Um, and that's not the way to engage with any community. Um, you need to do it up front. So our approach is only one approach, but we think it's the right approach, which is having uh, pill testing in conjunction um, with an educational process. Um, it's not a judgmental process, it's an educational process. And we don't demand anything of anyone we chat to, we just demand that they know what they're doing. Um, so uh, we're going to do it again at the end of this month. Are we April? We are April. Um, so we're tripling our, um, our team. Um, we're, we've actually been giving, given a physical structure uh, in which to operate. Um, and are you allowed to, will you be allowed to promote it this time? Because last time yes, we, we were on the map. Secret we were on the festival map. Right. Um, <laughs> so we were like, you know, in a bunker somewhere, yeah. you know, covered with old leaves. Yes. Um, but uh, on this occasion, people will come to us and we're expecting to get flogged. And I hope young Stephanie, who's in the back there, is ready for what's ah. the assault. That's about. The most important part, and just to reiterate something that Fiona said um, about the pill testing, is that the, the tech is kind of sexy, yes. it's, it's lovely, and it's fun, and we do get to find really cool shit out that way. Um, but the real secret sauce is dance-wise, um, and the consultation, and the education, and the personable, collegial conversations that occur. That's what makes people not die at music festivals, it's not a grumpy old curmudgeon like myself telling somebody what's in their drug. It's the interaction. Um, and any step short of that in Victoria, in my view, is a failure. And we need to be going for that approach. Rather, you, you have global best practice in Australia now, and you should be embracing that in Victoria when, when, when your time comes. Yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's a beautiful segue to the fact that uh, the talking about the community working in with regulators and actually providing best practice, consumer focused healthcare for those people who are desperately in need is something which Demos, you're well, you know, particularly through the fact that the, the supervised injecting room was uh, a battle to get that happening. Now there's a bigger discussion which we'll talk a little bit more about next steps and a little bit more about a broader drug policy setting after this. but. Just talk about how crucial that is to have a warm, uh, consumer-focused uh, effort to deal with some of the people who are the most disadvantaged, really. Thanks, Kevin. Um, like Nick, um, uh, you know, I studied history, and um, it's so important to contextualise how we got to this, to, to this point. Um, Nick, I, I did grow up in the 60s. Uh, I was part of that movement that um, that uh, didn't uh, criminalise pleasure. Yeah, quite the opposite. Uh, and that yes. seems, seems to be what a lot of this is, is the fear and the criminalisation of what's essentially um, uh, activity that that is prevalent in every society, every community. And it's that our response to it is really what is what is important, is what we do about that. It is not acceptable in, in any way that people die. It's, it's mm -hmm. just uh, my fundamental responsibility is to make sure people stay alive. I'm a public 
health official. And I'm not going to comment on it. I'm a bland, you know, health, health administrator, and I'm not allowed to make comments about public policy. <laughs> However, I have a fundamental duty of care uh, to our clients and to our community. And that's what drove uh, discussions at our place many years ago, going way back, uh, about what is possible to do. Um, so, going in, in terms of, of how this evolved, uh, because it, it shaped actually that response, it was very, very important. Most injecting rooms around the world uh, are standalone facilities. So, what they do is simply focus on keeping people safe. And that's incredibly important that we keep people safe in, in, in the process of consuming. And it is interesting in Europe, they actually call drug consumption rooms. Yes. Um, so, most, so that's, however, we're one of the few examples around the world of an integrated facility. So the medical supervised injecting room is in part of uh, an integrated uh, primary health care service with a broad access to a broad range of services. And in fact, that's actually specified in the legislation yeah. uh, as well. And this is quite unique, and this is why there's so much international attention on this model. Can we do more? Yeah. Gavin, um, one of the first things that we did, even before we opened, and after the um, announcement of the legislation we introduced in the Parliament, we met with about 80 of our clients. And it was one of the most uh, important, uh, important meetings that I attended. And the reason for that was because no matter what I thought, you know, I thought I was doing God's work and wonderful things, <laughs> and then people would come up to me and say, oh, you know, there's our client saying, yes, but what are you going to do about my dog when I'm injecting? Never thought about it. And she said to me, look, most people, she said, I'm homeless. A lot of young women here are homeless. Dogs are very important companion animals. I just said, oh, we're going to do about the dogs. Uh, so there's a whole lot of incredibly rich information that came from that, where we try to give, uh, include that thinking and community continual response. Into what is it that people actually want from us? It was so important that we start the conversation. Yeah. Because we uh, have uh, help people just come over the top of us, everybody. So we sort of know best, you know, the most money pants, super educated, we sort of know about everything. But it is so important, unless that consumer voice is, and, and the voice of communities, because they have a, the most legitimate stake, they're the two important stakeholders in all this. Unless they can shape these facilities, they will not be successful. They will not be successful by community. And that goes to the heart. Where, where does the pill testing movement come from? It's the people that use, use drugs who stay alive. This is, this is, this is just so important. And um, I did give, um, I, I sort of broke ranks with, uh, with uh, my normal demeanor around uh, this, you know, about not saying anything about public policy, but I was invited to give uh, yeah. evidence of the parliamentary committee. Mm -hmm. And I did, I, I went out and probably, and probably everyone said, we need to seriously think about strategic change in this area. And that includes decriminalisation. It, 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 we have to think, you know, look what's happening in jurisdictions such as Portugal. Uh, in, in Holland, they're closing prisons. Why is that? Because 70% of our prisons are in there for drug related offences. That's why. <coughs> and so if we can make, you know, if we can build a movement, it's so important that it starts with the people most affected. If we can build a movement, that's what brings. That's an important social change. That's what allows legislators such as Fiona to confidently go into Parliament and frame legislation which address that. So I think it's so significant that we are here today uh, with a group of people who are most affected by this issue. Uh, I have to do say something about uh, the injecting room, but it's, it's interesting. The median age of our, we are the heroin capital of Australia. Um, it is extraordinary. Uh, the sewer outfall. Evidence that, the, that they, I didn't, I didn't, I've forgotten that they do this, they check the sewer. Yeah, the wastewater. The yeah. wastewater. Yeah. And what they found were a federal parliament. That's right. And what they found was they, the headlines read Melbourne is this heroin capital of, of Australia. And our, in the profile of, of our use, 98% use heroin. 1% methamphetamine, so it's about, despite the moral panic about that. By the way, there is no difference in behaviour in our room whether you inject methamphetamine or heroin because you're in a Medical supervised environment. Uh, and the median age of heroin users in our group is 41 years. Old people in your context. <laughs> <laughs> Young people in my context. <laughs> Young people use heroin. Uh, so, uh, 
these, but that's to me, they're the sorts of things that shape how we're going to evolve this uh, very important uh, uh, social infrastructure. It's just something, if I may, just something that came up from what you were saying um, was that, and I completely understand the importance of making this a, a youth movement, but as you might expect, people who are very involved in politics look very closely at, um, at uh, surveys and polling, um, and we follow it minutely, month to month. And would anybody care to hazard a guess where the support for pill testing is increasing most? What demographic? Yeah, yeah. parents and grandparents. Cool. Um, so, I mean, you guys are already sold. Um, and I, I think it's incredibly important in this argument to ensure that as people who are sold, work, you continue to work on those people who need to buy the message. Um, this is what will probably get it all, not just your activism, but your activism acting secondarily on, on parents. So those, now, we're going to go broadly, we'll go back across the, the panel, we're just talking about the then next steps in this debate, because this is something which, it, it's interesting that we touched on that, that sewer outfall, uh, the testing of how many drugs, because we, there is the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare drug survey, which goes out to all households, mm -hmm. And then combined with the raw data of what actually people do take because your sewage does not lie, it shows that Australia has some of the highest drug consumption in the world. Yeah. Now, that's it's something... Olympian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so we're just good at... I've seen some people in person who are really good at too. So, it's <laughs> a case of we, we know that the evidence is there. And this is an area of policy which is not evidence-driven. So for people like us, we are evidence-driven. We know that this makes sense. Now, it doesn't just make sense because we believe that, that it's a rights issue. It makes sense because we spend a shite load of money in all the wrong areas. So we jail working-class people. Uh, we disadvantage a whole range of people through the law, just the, the law system. And we also make it so that we're spending lots on emergency care for people, so the highest form of medical care, when we could just have a better way to do it. We talked about decriminalisation, but I would actually suggest that there's the, the next one, which is provision. Provision of regulated drugs. What makes a drug illicit? Just who wrote a law one time? Mm -hmm. you know? So, for example, if we had a proper cost-benefit analysis on tobacco and alcohol now, would we have the same approach? Maybe. But what's the difference between MDMA and alcohol? Yep. In, but a, lot, a lot of people would say MDMA is a lot safer drug to use than we go. So that's to say that I will hand over to the panel to talk about really some of the next steps and really this pill testing we've looked at. What do you think, Fiona? I, I think one of the most, you know, there's, there's something quite perverse that, that drug policy is in, is in the health portfolio, but drug regulation is in the justice portfolio. Yep. So, I, and I think that's that's where there's this this real disconnect. So, in in talking about moving drug policy, um, you know, in treating it much more as a health issue, they'll say, "Well, we already yep. do. Well, we've got to move the laws into the health portfolio as yep. well." And and that's certainly so. In looking at some of the recommendations that the report made, I think one of the most important ones was to establish an advisory council on drugs policy. Yep. Now, if we can get the government to do that, because let's face it. 14% of Victorians regularly take drugs. 30% um, of young Victorians regularly take drugs. And I think that's probably under-reporting because that's the Household Drug Survey. Yeah. Now, I looked at what other advisory councils there are. Now, there's an advisory council for disabilities, and I know that this is, this is not a good, and we have an advisory council there. So when we look at the number of people that are affected by drug use, um, then I think that warrants a, a, drug, a drug policy council. And I think that would be a first step to bring it up to that level where, they, where the government is receiving expert advice about drug policy. And then we can start using that. So I, to me, that is the first step and that is the, one of the most important steps. Other, other steps, which is around decriminalisation, we, when we did the report, we could not call it decriminalisation. We went to Portugal, we saw the success of that decriminalisation model where the use and possession of any substance is not a crime. Um, in fact, it, it provides you with a pathway to education, it provides you with a pathway to treatment, 
it just provides you with a pathway to speak to someone if required, if you have problematic drug use. We know that the vast majority of people's drug use is not problematic. Um, so where we got to was depenalisation. Um, we were, it sounds like castration. It does. <laughs> it, it does, and, and you know I'm quite comfortable with it because I'm don't have a penis, so I didn't, didn't, you know, I didn't have that kind of yeah I didn't have that yeah that sharp recoil that I just saw you have, David. But but, um, but what we said is you know because because the, the the committee, which was a very diverse committee of Liberal, Labor, and Liberal and Labor members, couldn't come to that decriminalisation word. They could come to the other word, which I won't say again. Um, but that meant that what the simple way to do this was just to say, you know what, if a police officer catches, finds anyone with a substance, they must automatically divert. And, and because we know that diversion is available and we know that diversion doesn't happen in poorer suburbs. It happens in Turak. Yes. It doesn't happen in Broadmeadows. And so this is where this equality um, issue is, arises. And so if we just say to the police, no, you can't have any discretion here. There is no discretion. Everyone should be treated the same. Yeah. And that's what Portugal did. And, that, and, and the police struggled with that initially. But now, you know, after so many years of doing it, it's, it's, very, it's very natural for them. So I think, that's, I think those are two of the most crucial first steps and then I think, and you know, then I think things like hydromorphone in the supervised injecting centre, so we can break the nexus between um, the drug addiction and the criminal system, and we can do things, and those would be a really effective thing, a, a way to treat that. And there's many other things that I'd be happy to talk about, but I'll let yes, the panel. And, and I should say that this, we we will be around after this. Plus, the other thing is, we'll be around in general life. Like, we're it's pretty easy people to get on to. Hopefully. 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 <laughs> it will only take you two texts to get any of our numbers. You know? <laughs> so, that's where you'll be able to get on to us, and particularly, we're also people who are willing to chat to anyone at any time. So, say that now, Nick, if you could talk a little bit about your international uh, stuff, and then we'll just, I might go after Dave will speak a little briefly, but we're going to get a couple of questions because I know you're dying to ask questions. But so Nick, can you talk a little bit about the international experience and also just your uh, viewpoint on this? Yeah, so um, I, I guess I'd like to use this opportunity to, um, having just, just landed back and kind of recalibrating to the Australian conversation, I've been exposed to a lot of what's happening all around the world, which is, uh, you know, depending on the country, if you're in the Philippines, they're really, really behind us. But, you know, a couple of countries, a lot of countries in, that we would compare ourselves to, such as the Europeans or the North Americans, are light years ahead of us in terms of the discourse around drug policy reform, what it actually means. Um, and so I'll, I'd like to sort of use this opportunity to expand the scope of the conversation, given that we're largely preaching to the choir in this room. Yep. Um, and so um, <clears throat> I'll go back to what I said at the beginning, which was that I, the, so the 60 second commission on narcotic drugs, I'll have, we'll have a conference report up on the SSDP Dot org web website and give me about a week um, and you can read it in detail I'll also be um, have I want to do like an online webinar um, on the 15th so you can find the details of that on our website in about a day as well um, because translating what's happening at this UN to people at the grassroots is I think really important um, but at the same time not that much happens there okay so it's the 62nd one of these um, there's this thing called the Vienna consensus it happens in Vienna every year and um, to change the international drug conventions, every single member state of the commission, which is like 58 member states from all around the world, have to agree, which, funnily enough, never happens, which is why the international drug treaties essentially have never changed. Um, and so that's one aspect. Um, and I think the... Um, so it's, that's the international mechanism for how drugs are prohibited, right, since the Second World War, since we have a United Nations. But drug prohibition which it's really important to frame, is a historical anomaly. It's not normal for a society to prohibit psychoactive substances in human history. It's actually really abnormal in the last 120 years, and it's been a dismal failure. Um, and that's really, really, really important to note. Um, and you can actually trace, going putting my history teacher hat back on, you can actually trace the, before the, you know, before it was prohibited through the commission, you can trace the history of drug prohibition quite alongside the entire history of colonization and right through into the Industrial Revolution. And so how it intersects with a whole bunch of other 
social justice issues is really, really complicated. And it, to be honest, the most complex thing I've ever encountered. And that's largely why I work in this space. Um, and I'd really like to reiterate Demos's acknowledgement of country as well. Just first of all, acknowledge that we're on unceded territories of the Wurundjeri Nation and that um, the way that drug policies, I mean, all bad policies disproportionately affect Indigenous people, but drug policies uh, is one significant one of those. I mean, the intersections with Indigenous incarceration are complex and underreported in Australia. Um, the ways in which um, people of colour and Indigenous people are disproportionately criminalised and searched and arrested and put into the law enforcement system all around the world is, is a, a very central conversation in the drug policy debates in a lot of countries. And it's something that we're really behind on in Australia. I think it's just because we're really behind talking about race in general in this country. Um, and to be honest, my engagement with the Indigenous community so far is that they've got a bunch of other things that they're just trying to deal with first. We're the only Western country without a fucking treaty. Anyway. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, really taking that intersectional approach and looking at how um, communities that have been most adversely affected by these laws can have a stake in the reform process. Um, one really interesting thing I learnt, um, which we can learn from our Kiwi cousins across the pond, is that um, in their medicinal cannabis legalisation process, um, the first licence that was given to an organisation to grow medicinal cannabis was given to the Hikurangi tribe in the northeast of, um, of the North Island. Um, so the, the Māori, a, a community that's been disproportionately arrested and criminalised throughout this process, are now first at the table in terms of how legal access to that drug will be, you know, decided, how the stuff will be grown, they're building a, a, you know, an educational course with the local polytechnic tape to get young Māori into the system and, and learning about how to grow medicinal cannabis and, and, and sell it, essentially. Um, and so all those questions around who grows this stuff, who profits from this stuff, and how do those reform, you know, discourses run, I think we've got a huge huge amount of work to do in Australia to catch up internationally around who's actually disproportionately affected and who should actually profit from the legalisation process, which is inevitably going to occur in our lifetime. Yes. Excellent. Now, we might, over there, and if you can dying to speak, we might go to some questions, and if, and if I throw that in yeah. mic, I'll just, I'll go around, because, you know, where would we be at a conference without being able to actually just kick out to the audience and meet to look like some kind of second rate kind of Channel 31? <laughs> uh, no, actually, no, I should say Channel 9. If I'm going to use it, I'm not going to say it in quiet because, good lord, I'm not having that. Uh, oh, it, seriously, you want the campaign to share with you? Yeah, that's good. Go for it. Um, in terms of like advocating for the, the recommendations, you, you were saying that pill testing was the one that Victorian Labor had been told no, don't bring it up before the federal election because Bill Shorten will not be able to capitalise on that. What about all the other recommendations? That's Why right. has Labor not commented on them? The, the, their response yeah. last year was absolutely abysmal. Yes. And no one has said anything about it since. And no. it was not, like, I'm just wondering where you think we go with that. Look, it's... It's a work in progress, and I certainly think that any... Please advocate for them. Please write to your local members. Um, let's push this. Because, as I said, the vast majority of them didn't don't require legislative reform. They just require the ministers to, to enact it. Um, and, you know, so this shouldn't be scary for them. They, they, so I think it's just continuing to alert them to it, continuing to to bang on their doors about these issues, and we will see it happen. Um, I suspect, look, and I was warned that last September when the government was going to respond to it, they didn't want to say anything that could be used in the upcoming election. So, which is weak, and it's piss poor, and I don't think any, they could have said some really good things that could have been used in the election to help them win. Um, not that they needed much help. Um, but it's, it's an interesting it, point because it did come into the election anyway. That's so right. Particularly on radio and in the Liberal signage. Absolutely. And in recognising that when the Premier talked about the reasons that they were re-elected, the supervised injecting centre was one of those. Yes. Yes. Was one of those examples yes. that, he, that he used. So I think that we in this room, um, and particularly those inside the party, it, we need to put pressure on the government to keep moving forward. If they're going to consi consider themselves progressive, then their policy on pill testing 
is completely at odds with being the most progressive state. Yes, now, are there, are there any other questions that we got? Let's thank our wonderful panel for...